so thank you for coming back. And uh, we're going to work on uh, an example where you get to use FakeNet yourself. Hopefully, you've had a chance to copy the VM uh, off. Uh, if not, uh, there are USB sticks going around. If you left the earlier with the USB stick and you came back with it now, please pass that off to somebody else to copy it or return it to us up front. Um, yeah, the way it works is um, we saw a fake net. It's pretty easy. You just double-click to run it, right? Uh, and that's on the desktop. But if we want to change the settings, we have to go to C, Tools, Fake Net 2. So a lot of the lab is talking about uh, changing the settings. So you're going to have to go into there and open up this fakenet.cfg file. You can open it up in Notepad, and you can manipulate it there. Uh, if you notice, the lab is in Z malware, uh, and then the lab is lab underscore evil. Also, there's a text document there, lab.txt, that's going to contain like the questions for the lab. So you open that up, we could take a quick peek at that. So it's one after another sort of steps that take you through uh, how to analyze it. So, you know, first is let's just run the malware with fake net on. So start like that, right? After that, it's, you know, what do you see the malware download? What web pages does it go to? Uh, then maybe try and uh, turn on this NX domains option to see if you could tease out additional domains. So basically, just try and figure out as many domains, as many connections as you could get it to go. After that, uh, we're going to turn on process logging which means you go into the configuration file and turn that on um, by setting the process logging to yes. Uh, after the process logging, then you'll be able to identify which process is actually doing the malicious activity. Um, and being that we're asking it, you could, you could bet <laughs> that lab underscore evil.exe is not the process that's doing the network connectivity. Right? That wouldn't make the example very cool. So uh, turn on process logging, and then figure out what process is actually doing the connection. Uh, after you've done that, you move to, uh, now you want to set the breakpoint like we were demonstrating. So you use that connection break functionality. That is inside of connection break. This uh, change that option from no to yes. Also, make sure you turn on uh, Ollie debug as your just-in-time debugger. So you go to Options, Just-in-Time Debugging, Make Ollie Debug My Just-in-Time Debugger, and then Done. And you could close out. Once you've done that and set this to Yes, any process that starts up and makes a network connection is going to break in your debugger. So what we want to do there is reconfigure that, restart FakeNet, and, uh, and then run your malware. Hopefully it'll break. And then you're going to track down. Maybe there's other domains that the malware might connect to that you wouldn't have seen unless you use this debugging breakpoint. Um, also, uh, and then after that, it's you know figuring out the puzzle is the final step uh, to figure out how to get um, what can you have FakeNet serve the malware, right? Because in FakeNet, we could have it serve the malware anything it's asking for, right? If malware is doing a GET request for a web page, uh, we could serve it whatever web page we want. We just go into C, Tools, FakeNet, and then the default files. In here is just a bunch of files that are served up. For example, the, uh, Andy showed earlier the FakeNet mini program. When you run that, it just does a pop-up. But we could change that. We could put any executable, any file we want in there, and that's what FakeNet will serve up instead. Right? So the, the final step is, what can you have FakeNet serve up the malware such that uh, it gets it to, uh, the malware to... Uh, open a message box. Uh, basically says, like, you win or something like that. So that's the goal of the lab. You go through all those different steps. So it's uh, exercising each of the functionality uh, of FakeNet and, uh, and getting, getting familiar with it. If you uh, sort of get stuck on that, we're here to help you. Uh, also, uh, if, you, if you want to start running other files um, inside of Z malware, there were the files I ran in class, which was webserver.exe, if you wanted to try that again, or demo.exe. And you remember, demo.exe is the one that injected into calc. Um, so we were able to see that. Also, the labs from the book are here. So you can um, run any of, the, any of the 50 binaries 
from the book so that way you can uh, you know, tease out network functionality using fake net as well. So there's a pile of binaries you could play around with, but um, the major focus is um, to get through this, figure out what the key is. So uh, I guess, uh, do you guys have any questions on fake net, life, anything like that? <laughs> We have all the answers. And so, yeah. So uh, with that, uh, I will, I guess uh, the goal is, is I think we have an hour, right, until 3.15. So we're going to give you like 30 minutes right now to work on this. Uh, and then we'll go over it and show you how to, how to get the answer. <laughs> so go for it. Oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, the next domains option, I don't know if we talked about it too much, but it's basically the way to, um, sometimes malware, like, if you return a valid domain name to a piece of malware right away, then you're not going to tease out the additional domain names from a piece of malware, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, there might be like 10 other embedded domain names, and we wanted to siphon through all those domain names. That's where the NX domain option comes in. You could set that to something greater than zero inside of FakeNet, and that'll return a non-existent domain for each of the requests. Right, so like let's say he requests a.com and then b.com, and then that is only two. If you do NX domain one, like set it to one, the next time it requests a.com, it'll actually return valid. So this is a way to tease out additional domains. Right. Yeah, so the NX domains may or may not be useful, in other words. So. All right. So let's uh, go over this then. Start by running uh, FakeNet. And uh, let's take a look at uh, what happens when we run the evil binary. Nothing apparently. <laughs> Why it broke there? Let me try and run it again. Oh, I must not have networking set up. Which is weird because I went to the clean snapshot, which should have it. Huh. It's a little odd. Maybe Fignet wasn't done closing out. Okay. So we ran it. Um, and it, it says, well, it looks like we have a user agent of surfs up, and it looks like it goes to bb.exe, uh, or sorry, bb.practicalmyronalysis.com. It does a request for test.jpg. Uh, also looks like maybe it goes to hello.malwareanalysisbook.com. Uh, so those are the couple uh, domains that we were able to see so far. Also, if we turn on NX uh, domains, uh, we'll see that we, we really only get those two domains. So the next, uh, unless you got lucky. If you got lucky, you, you maybe saw another domain because um, there is a randomness factor with what the other domains that it hits. Uh, so the next step was to turn on process logging. So we could go into tools, fake net, configuration. Turn on the process logging, which will be on by default in the future. But the point is to learn, run it, and we run the uh, malware. And this time we see that hey, notepad.exe is connecting over port 80. So we now know that the process that's been injected to is notepad.exe. Now we want to do the connection break functionality to pinpoint the code that's doing the connecting. So we're going to turn on uh, inside of FakeNet. We'll turn on connection break. We will... Uh, turn on our just-in-time debugging. And then now we have just-in-time debugging open. 
So we should break when we uh, when we run the malware this time. And we were able to break, we're in the exception handler, so we're going to step out of it. And then we're going to do what we did earlier, which was, hey, let's take a, we took a look at the stack trace. There wasn't really much to be had there. It didn't get us back to the original place where it's coming from, because obviously our code's not all coming from WinINet. So we think there might be shell code. So what we could do is set our break on access on the RWE section, which is the section with the shell code. Hit play. And it breaks uh, on access when it gets back to that shell code, which tells us that, hey, this previous call was the one that actually did the, ended up doing the connect. It was a higher level call to some one INET function, but we don't know which one. That's fine. But let's poke around and see you know, if there's anything here to be found, like Earlier, we were looking on the stack in the demo example. And look, there appears to be some strings on the stack here. So we turn this into some ASCII to look at. And we start to see test.jpg makes sense to us. Super evil.txt, we haven't seen that yet. Um, so that's a new string that we've now found. Also, we see bb.practicalmalwareanalysis.com, which was one of the places it went. Also, we see the other one, which is hello.malware.book.com. Uh, we see that as well, but now we see two new domains. And the do new domains is one is the password is .com, and the other is orval and rochefort .com slash super evil .text. So right away we could start thinking that hey, maybe there's a couple extra domains in there that happen with some frequency, right? Uh, maybe it's going to go to those domains in some other occasion. But we are able to see those by having a breakpoint here and be able to uh, go directly to that spot. Also, we see this you found me exclamation point string. So we don't, we don't know what that is used for, but that's probably getting that message box to pop up like we were talking about. So the next step requires you to be a reverse engineer, obviously, because you have to figure out how you can get it, uh, like what has to occur to get that message box to pop up. So you have to perform some code analysis here. And so. If you analyze the show code at all, the best thing to do would be to rip it out, pull it into something like IDA, if you ha and we have the freeware loaded on this VM. It's a good place to start. Um, or you could just look at it in Ollie and reverse it that way. Also, this is in a loop. If you remember, it was, it was in a loop going to different domains, right? Like it would do four or five of them uh, in a row, and then before exiting. So maybe this is going to loop up. So I could probably step through this a little bit and see if that happens. So that's the internet read file. That's where it's you know, getting something from the system. And it's jumping around. It, so it's, it's going up in some loop. We know it's going to loop through this again. Now it's calling get tick count and then doing some type of mathematical equation on it before deciding to jump here or not. And if I take a look, and if I, you know, if I were, while analyzing this code, I'd realize that if this jump is taken, that's going to take me to where that it, it's been before. So we don't want this, this jump to be taken. So we want to like, you know, do something like flip the zero flag so that way it's not taken. And then we see a series of calls here. So we could step through those. See internet open with surfs up. Makes sense. That's what we've been seeing so far. We see internet open URL. However, this time it's different. Right, if we take a look, now it's orval and rochefort.com slash supereval.txt. So maybe what we have to serve up via the super evil is the thing we should go after. Next, we scroll down through the code a little bit because we know that after it does an internet open URL, it's going to do an internet read file. And we saw that happen earlier at this location. And what gets returned to the internet read file is a buffer, right? So maybe it's comparing something to that buffer. And we see two comparisons here, one to 34 and one to 32. And what is 34 and 32 in ASCII? 34 and 32. 
or hex, hex 34 and hex 32, I should say. 42, right? So I kind of gave the hint a little bit earlier in the class, right, as to what the, the code was. So it looks like it checks the first two bytes of super evil dot text for having the 42 as the string. And if it does, it looks like it's going to come down here and do this call. So we could kind of step through this a little bit. Oh, I just think I stepped over it. Oh, no, it's, it's actually in our breakpoint, which is pretty funny. Of course, because it's doing a connect. So we see the internet read file. Of course, it's not going to be fed the 42. So we're going to have to kind of trick it here. So right here, it's going to say jump is taken. We don't want that to happen, right? Because that's the comparison to the 4. Then there's a comparison to the 2. We don't want that to happen either. Where am I? Jump is taken. Oh, no. Sorry. Set. And then it comes down here. So we basically forced it to go through. And now we see that it's about to call a message box. And if we step over that, we'll see. Hopefully our message box came up. You found me. And so that's the key. So it does require some analysis. But here, you see how FakeNet caught that entire transaction that I just stepped through, which was, you know, went to the Orval and uh which I know many of you found. But then the, the trick is, is what do we serve up as super evil? So what we could do is to force FakeNet to serve that up, we could go into the FakeNet tools, FakeNet2 default files, and put in, a, you know, if it's going to get a super evil text, we can change, we could put a different uh, text file in there, right? One that any file that starts with 42 will do it. And by default, if uh, FakeNet will serve up an HTML page, so we, ju we could just change this HTML page to start with 42, and that's good enough to get it to, to pop. Of course, it has to actually go to that domain, which is something we forced to happen. Um, and the way the show code works is actually every one out of a thousand chance, it'll actually go there. Versus the other two domains were like 50% chance. So possible for malware to do this exactly? No. But is it realistic that malware might go to a bunch of domains before actually going to the real one? Oh, yeah. That definitely happens all the time. Right? They're trying to test and see if that connection is available. I've seen a piece of malware that you know, goes to Google.com every day for a week. And then on, on day eight is when it actually goes to the bad place. So, I mean, it is a realistic uh, scenario. Um, so, I think that's, did you have anything else to add to lab? No. Okay. So, uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd like to take them now. Okay. If not, that's it for the fake network shop. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>